This is F Society IRC Podcast, a Mr. Robot show. I'm your moderator of this chat, Hiroja Shai. Please note that this podcast will have spoilers. In this chat, we will discuss the underlying themes, historical influences, inspirations, technology, ethical dilemmas, and other inspirational insights we have gleaned from each episode of the first season of Mr. Robot. We will be bringing on experts to share their insights and knowledge with us in each chat. We will also be reviewing each episode of the first season, as well as the second season when it premieres. We are awake, we are free, we are alive for F Society IRC Podcasts. Hello, F Society IRC. Uh, this is Rosha Shaib, your moderator for this chat. And we're going to do a little bit things differently for this episode, Mr. Robot. Uh, it's not going to be necessary to scene by scene throughout the episode, but more of a, an analysis of some of the very key scenes that have happened uh, in this show. Uh, broken it, I've decided to break it up into three parts. Uh, I'm taking the, the first half we're going to talk about the Ramon, Mosby, Darlene, and the FBI agent uh, uh, DePerry as we uh, discuss their kind of storyline there with Trenton kind of a little bit in there as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the, like, the, the philosophy of the different hackers that are kind of clashing here. Uh, the second part will be about Angela, and I would say either the very slow corruption of Angela by being part of Evil Corp or the best double agent there's ever existed. Um, the way they've been playing the character, I haven't made my mind out, out or up about her, which I kind of like because it makes her character is very compelling and very intriguing. And then the last part, which is going to be pretty much the bulk of the, the show, is going to be the Elliot portion of the review. Uh, dealing with Elliot and Ray and Tyler Wellick and the different concepts that came up and what's kind of going on there with him, with Elliot versus Mr. Robot. So this is, you know, the review of the Colonel Panic, and let's kind of begin here with the first part with Ramon. So the episode in itself starts with Ramon and Mosby. And they are actually going to the Fun Society Arcade. Um, at this point, this is more of a flashback to the very beginning where Mosby is coming to Ramon to kind of get this place as a hangout. And Ramon is a, is a felon. He has served six years for some kind of hu- computer uh, crime. We don't know specifics of the crime, only that he served time. And he obtained this property through his cellmate, and he tells this very kind of elaborate story about the history of the property in itself. And there's all sorts of crazy stuff, like there's a there's a, a father murdering his uh, family, there's a woman that has an accident, uh, the cellmate that gave him this property, uh, you know, is charged for the double murder of his family, he's not responsible for it. And this guy who was a celly, as he calls him, uh, Clyde, believes that the, the, the arcade in of itself is the nexus of all evil. And as he's telling this story to Mosby, uh, Mosby's like, do you believe in this superstitious stuff? And Ramon says that he doesn't give a shit, you know, he's a felon. And it's very hard for him to get a job, so he's willing to, to rent the place for basically half the market pr- price of 2500 and. Mosey's not there to necessarily rent the place. I mean, he is there to obtain the place, but he wants to recruit Ramon into what is to become the F Society. And Ramon wants nothing to do with it. He's like, I, you know, he doesn't want to get into that shit again. He served his time. He doesn't want to go back to prison. And Mosey is slowly, like, you know, saying, you know, hey, this guy, he's, he's different. The best coder ever is about getting back to society, about getting back to, you know, the people that took you know, six years of his life away from him. And this is a very intriguing conversation in and of itself because it's, it's about the nature of, you know, hacking and collectives and groups and the purpose and, and what they set out for. Uh, Ramon in itself is a freaker. Uh, freakers, if you're unfamiliar with that term, are individuals that basically utilize the phone or telecommunication lines back in the day, which was with the primary means of access of communication. And basically they manipulated the telephone companies either through the use of hardware 
where they have uh, little boxes that allow them to make you know free long distance phone calls, or the ability to gain access to the various nexus points to be able to enter uh, computer systems or infiltrate the telecommunication company to basically again to kind of at the time initially it was free phone calls to access points of, of data and he was the best at it uh, is considered the best at it and he invented a number of the techniques that people were utilizing. I found this very intriguing because it is similar to a real life hacker by the name of Kevin Metallic. Um, if you remember from last season one of the early websites that Elliot, when he was talking about how he got into hacking, uh, there was a flash of a website called Free Kevin. And, and Free Kevin was a campaign to, to free a hacker by the name of Kevin Metallic. And he was a freaker. He was primarily mostly known for social engineering, being able to convince people to give up vital information either over the phone or in person. Uh, he was one of the best at doing that. He ended up going to jail uh, twice, one for one early in the 80s for a year and then again for three years. There's a big campaign. A lot of people within the computer industry, uh, the pioneers if you will, like Steven Walzak, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, a number, Bill Gates, a number of people campaigned to try to get this guy out of prison that he shouldn't be serving time for what he did and eventually he was let out. Um, he was done in a couple of different books about his life, particularly about hacking. Uh, his autobiography, if you will, is called Ghost in the Wire. Uh, he's done a book called The Art of Deception and The Art of Intrusion, which are two very prominent and key hacking books if you want an understanding of computers and hacking and social engineering. It's a, it's a good blueprint that a lot of hackers utilize or people that are uh, affiliated with uh, computing that have read the read these type of books. You, you probably most likely see one or all three of these books on their shelves. And so Ramon as a character kind of reminds me of that similar type of person. Uh, he's much older than the other characters of Mosby and uh, Darlene and Elliot in the sense that he is an old school hacker. From the very beginning of when hacking or the computer age, if you will, was forming. And the number of laws that are in place now when it comes to hacking and, and computer fraud and all that stuff were not in place when Ramon was starting. So for him to have been eventually caught and going as long as he did without, you might say, being caught and going to prison is not only pretty amazing but also at the same time kind of sucking because we don't know exactly the nature of the type of crime that he did. Uh, which kind of reminds me of the Aaron Schwartz story in the sense that Aaron Schwartz was, you know, one of the principal uh, pioneers out there when it came to not only hacking but development of open source systems, particularly the R, you know, doing the RS feeds and Reddit, and the fact that the federal government came down on them very hard using what many people now consider a very antiquated law system. The I think it's computer. Digital Fraud Act that was developed in the 80s that has been utilized a lot to go after hackers and in, in, in different types of uh, digital crimes, if you will. And basically what he had done was he had taken um, MIT's, um, the data from LexisNexis and the digital journals there, and he just resourced it and re-uploaded it online and made it freely available for people. And even though he legitimately had access to the information and it was his log information, but what they were going after was the fact that he redistributed this information. And it all goes back to about the nature of information, whether you believe it should be free, whether it should be paid, whether these walls should exist or not, uh, a lot of this ethical, moral, and even legality about it in, in, in principle. But they, they came out of them very hard. It was about based up to almost 15 years in prison. Um, it was really ridiculous. It was, I would say, an overcharging of the nature of the type of crime. Because of that, you know, facing all that those charges, he ended up committing suicide. The reason why I bring this up is it kind of brings uh, these analogs that are influencing a number of characters on the show. It, it's obvious that Ramon has some type of influence there. And the reason why I bring up the Aaron Schwartz thing was is the nature and the toll of, you know, these type of crimes on people that are are curious like Ramon, that they want to build or bring um, either systems down or understanding them and tinkering. And as we go along in the episode, we learn more about Ramon. 
the re the reason why I bring this up is uh, it's obvious that there might be some kind of influence with the Kevin Metallic character on Ramon, but most importantly, it, it it demonstrates that there's kind of this myth when it comes to hackers or people that are very tech savvy that they go off and you know make tons of money, um, to establish and create billion dollar companies, and this didn't happen for Ramon, and it'd be interesting to see. This guy that's considered a genius in his field and has started so early, why that particularly didn't happen for him? Um, was it a particular philosophy that he had, the, the nature of a, the dynamic of what he was seeking to do? Uh, he didn't found any type of like hacking groups of his own or a foundation, if you will, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Things of that nature, the, the fact that he was broke, that he couldn't find any work, that nobody was scooping him up. Um, it could, you know, race could play a factor into that um, dynamic, but at this point, you know, it's just, it was just interesting to see, as we get a little bit of a background about Ramon, you know, what his skill set is, what he was doing there, and why he was, you know, recruited, and it was his access not only to this property, but his skill set, and one of the reasons why this property was so good for uh, F society, if you will, was not only does, well, we don't know if it's Elliot or Mr. Robot that Mosby is referring to, but he had, you know, obviously there's an affinity for Coney Island on the part of Mr. Mr. Robot and even Elliot because he did talk about going there quite a bit with his father. But the property in of itself is in limbo. Nobody knows who exactly owns it. The paperwork, is, if you will, is in flux. So because there's no set established owner, if you will, of the property, it allows for this enough of ambiguity that it's not going to be traced back to anybody. If anybody were to find the place, it's once again, it's not going to go back to them, which is one of the reasons why, and this is going to play a little, later, a little bit later on when we talk about it, the end of the world party happened last season was to you know, pepper the place with enough fingerprints and enough people in the area and enough of a presence that if anybody were ever to do a significant forensic, you know, I don't know what the term would be, but any serious, you know, down to the tiles, if you will, the toothbrush with, with forensic, they're not going to find anything. There would be too much, uh, too many other people, too many factors, too many fingerprints for them to go through for them to be able to trace anybody down. But at this key point, what we do understand is that this uh, place was originally, um, you can say, in the possession of Ramon. That not only that, but Mosby himself is a felon. We learned that from the conversation between him and Ramon. And so they have a connection, a bond, if you will. And this also kind of speaks to the group dynamics, how groups break, within groups break down. And so obviously Ramon and, and Mosby are kind of in a partnership, if you will while we have Darlene and Elliot on the other side of this partnership, if you if you think, within the group of F Society. And then you have Trenton that's kind of like in the middle, where she has a strong affiliation or, or, or allegiance, if you will, with Darlene last season, but that soon changes. And what changes that is when Mosby goes to Ramon's house, because he hadn't seen him for a while, and Ramon's mom knows him. Um, we know that uh, Ramon... Um, does stuff with marijuana, he's a bit of a drug dealer, that's how he pays some of the bills there. His mother is sick, she has uh, cataracts, she's, you know, he's there to take care of her, being a good son. And as Mosby goes down, um, the mom knows who he is, but she can't quite see him. He goes down to the area where Ramon is growing stuff, and Ramon is dead. Um, he's shot. Uh, it looks like he's been dead for a while. Uh, there's a broken electronics, looks like a broken phone, um, there's a gun, and it doesn't look quite like a struggle, but it's obvious that he was murdered. Because the gun was there as well, I think it's an open interpretation that it could look like a suicide, or might be a suicide, but at this point, uh, we're just going to go with murder. and. The fact that he has been there for a little bit, for a while, is indicative to the nature of the group and the fact of how much they keep in touch in the real world. 
but the, kind of the breakdown of the group as well. Um, I would say he's been probably been there for at least about a week, maybe two weeks. And mind you, the hack happened at five nine. We opened the episode and it's June eleventh. So even if it was a couple of days from that date, like June fifteenth or June nineteenth, it's only been a month since the hack and Ramon is dead. And Mosby freaks out. Uh, he ends up going to meet with Darlene on the subway system. He's extremely nervous. Uh, the subway, you know, the scene opens up with a man singing on the train. He's singing an opera song. Uh, he's asking for donations. This is typical kind of New York stuff. Uh, there's police on the train. There's actually a, quite a bit of a heavy presence of police, if you will. And this is, I think it's kind of like with the, the opera man singing and the police presence in the subway. Again, this is a lot of the stuff that's been in the foreground um, that was in the season premiere in both parts where you see the kind of slow breakdown of society, the changes in society because of the in essence an economic collapse. There's an increase if you can say security for the purpose of preventing violence or petty larceny or robberies of that nature. Um, the fact that the man, you know, an opera singer sounds like he was trained is you know, the begging that's going on um, in the background is slowly creeping in from the, the foreground into, or say the background, into the foreground. And so Mosby's a little bit nervous. The police get off the subway. Darlene comes up right after. She's on the same train. And they have a discussion. And Darlene is like, you know, Elliot and I warned you about him. He, he was a drug dealer. He was a liability. And Mosby is just, you know, shocked by her demeanor that... She's being an asshole, you know, he's dead, you know, what are you going to do? And Darlene just kind of sticks on message, sticks on point, you know, what did you do? And he, in, in implying, did he like clean up after himself to make sure that nobody knew he was there? Um, whatever kind of potential stuff that Ramon might have had lying around, did he pick it up or destroy it? Uh, he indicates that, you know, his mom knows that knows him, but she doesn't know anything. So this leads into a much later conversation where they meet up with Trenton, whom we haven't seen up at this point. And from the demeanor of Darlene, what we get to understand is that Trenton and Ramon had kind of distanced himself from the group, from the hack. And Trenton was like, well, what we did was fantastic and great. It was a, a big thing, but she wasn't in, interested in what Darlene was doing, which was the uh, burning of money in the um, park and just like little shenanigan things. She was like, she seems to be more hardcore than Darlene when it comes to keeping F Society moving and, and destroying Evil Corp, if you will. Uh, Mosby thinks that it was possibly the Dark Army that's responsible for Moan's death. Um, he was murdered. Uh, they talk about Gideon's death, the fact that Gideon's dead, that there's two murders linked to this hack. Darlene doesn't think it's the Dark Army. Darlene thinks it's other things, that the guy that killed Gideon has been caught. That is really about just Ramon and his um, drug dealing ways that kind of caught up with him. And it has nothing to do with the hack or with the Dark Army. Mosey begs to differ. They uh, have a bit of an out about it, and Darlene's like, you guys just need to basically sack up, and get with the program. Things are on course, things are going well, it is not the Dark Army. You know, Elliot and her were the only people that were associated with the Dark Army. They, that there's no way the Dark Army knew who they were, like Ramon or Mosby or Trenton. And Mosby implies that that is not the case, that someone else might have been in communication with the Dark Army. But we have no idea who that per individual could be. It could be Tyler Wellick. It could be somebody else. Uh, obviously, there's a. It's been hinted for a while since the, the uh, last season that there's another player that is a part of that society. That, you know, it's been implied that might be actually the personality of Mr. Robot. But I'm thinking it might be just another individual altogether that is part of their plan, is part of their group that they don't openly discuss. Um, or at least with the audience um, at this moment. So uh, Darlene leaves, thinking the matter is settled, that she's trying to get Trenton and Mosby back on board. Mosby wants to leave to Arizona. He's going to flop. He's just going to bail out. He doesn't want the Dark Army coming after him. 
And then Darlene leaves. Um, they were at, they had meet at Trenton's home. Um, Darlene leaves, and Mosby and Trenton are staying. And Mosby's like, I don't trust those two. Those two are together. You know, we're the loose ends. You know, they could be covering their tracks. It could not be Mark Darby. It could be them. And it kind of leaves like leaves it like that. And that comes to the part where we get to the Dominique Verdetti, the FBI agent. Um, basically what happened was that she got called in because, you know, uh, Ramon's a known hacker. The body was reported. The police come over and they're going through his stuff to kind of determine who murdered him. Now, what was interesting about this particular sequence of events is that, you know, the, the NYBD is taking the lead. Um, they've contacted the FBI and actually started contacting the names on this list that Ramon had. And this list basically was a list of... Uh, so, Angela's story is um, a bit complicated, if you will. It's, it's very ambiguous about where they're going with this story. Um, I personally have two mindsets about it. They either are showing the, the slow corruption of an individual that participates in Evil Corp, um, which would be very intriguing considering um, Angela's history with Evil Corp, with the fact that her mother was, um, was in essence poisoned by Evil Corp due to a leak at the factory that she worked at, that it was covered up by Evil Corp and all the heartache and hardship that has occurred because of the company or Angela's like the best double agent that has ever lived really and has slowly worked her way into the Evil Corp infrastructure to where she has almost an unfettered, unfettered access to the power structure and could in essence help take Evil Corp down from within because I don't think when Kobe said for her to accept the job after offer, I don't think she's seeking to do good in the sense of changing the corporate, the, the corporate culture of Evil Corp, but seeking to take it down because much like Elliot, she despises Evil Corp. So when we open up with Angela, she, um, Price gives her the condolences about Gideon's death and uh, because Angela has been summoned to Price's office um, Angela accepts the condolences. Um, Price wants Fox now instead of Bloom Bloomberg, which is an interview that Angela fought very hard to set up for him. And he's kind of a bit dismissive of it. Um, he wants no pre-interviews to prove all questions and kind of wants it now, if you will, um, within the next day or so. And Angela, you know, at first accepts it as, you know, these are her marching orders and then she She's about to leave the office, and then she turns around and says no. She makes a counter-proposal and basically says that Bloomberg is where their investors get their information, their news. They, they don't watch Fox News. And the best bet for Price was to stick with the Bloomberg interview and not go on Fox. And that's when Fo uh, Bloomberg, I mean not Bloomberg, but Price tells her to sit down. And obviously they've had this conversation before, or these type of conversations because she knew exactly where to sit down. There's a bunch of chairs in his office. And so she sits down on the couch and he gets out from back from from the back of his, you know, desk and comes over to her and sits right next to her. And it's kind of a very intimate position. I mean they're not face to face or right next to each other. And instead of talking about the interview, he says, Have you ever been to this restaurant called Fidel's? And she goes, No. Uh, and he knows the chef uh, he, this, this particular chef makes like the best dish um, that I can't pronounce. It sounds like an Italian dish um, ever, and that she should have some. And then he has a little bit about the history of the the restaurant. It used to be like this really you know dive dive bar, but now it's like one of the best restaurants in the city. You know, five star restaurants type of a deal. And he says that they're gonna go. They're gonna go on Saturday. He's gonna send a car to pick her up, and that's pretty much the deal. And then he, then he walks away, and she's like, oh, okay. She seems a little perplexed and shocked by, by this invitation, if you will. And then as soon as he gets behind his desk, he says that she was right, that they should stick with the Bloomberg interview. And that seems to be kind of the, the end of the, the business portion of the conversation. 
And then as she's leaving, she's, she looks at this picture that's on his wall, and he has two big pictures on his wall. He has one that's behind him at his desk, which is a a picture of Europe um, prior to World War One, where all the, the boundary lines, if you will, um, were set. And then the second picture, the picture that Angela's looking at, is a Lithgow of the day after the news that hit of when Arch, the Duke Arch Ferdinand was uh, assassinated. Him and, and his wife were assassinated. And basically, you know, Philip Price goes to her and he goes, I see that you look at this picture all the time every time you're in my office. Maybe you perhaps you find it assassinating as I do. And he says, you know, why he keeps it is that a man with one well-placed shot can change the world. And I guess in, in essence it's kind of a bit of a an analogy about what's going on with the whole collapse of the economy going on there. You know, what F Society has done is they have placed one well shot at the, the power structure, if you will, and is slowly causing disintegration of society as we see it. Uh, we see it all in the background, and some of it has started to percolate into the foreground with, you know, the increased police presence. Um, in the Ramon storyline, which I didn't quite touch on, but I'm going to touch on here, uh, you see, not, you know, with Mosby, the increased police presence. Uh, when Agent uh, Delapa, she, when she went to Ramon's house, in front of Ramon's house were all a series of trash cans, or trash bags, if you will, and he saw people digging through the trash to get whatever could be considered valuable in, in out of the trash. And also, when we get to Angela, we see the people um, protesting um, outside of the restaurant, which is either because this location is somewhere in, within the Wall Street district, or because they're following around Philip Price and protesting, you know, what is happening. And in this restaurant is completely, nearly completely empty except for Angela's party. And another thing that happens is that Phil Price has to prepay for the restaurant. So there's a significant shift of what has happened before prior to 5-9 to and to what is now. And because we see this shift and the fact that Phil Price actually paid in cash, it's kind of an indication of just just the kind of the frame and the breakdown of what's going on here. Now another thing that's happened is um, like I said that the restaurant in itself is you know nearly empty. Um, prior to getting to the restaurant Angela you know is dressed in the nine, she's talking to the mirror into the mirror, she's you know doing the positive affirmation things about you know saying that she's beautiful, uh, she's earned this, she knows what she's you know just these positive things that she's trying to psych herself up to do this, to go to this to this restaurant with Philip Price. And as she gets there and she's walking in there with the hostess, um, she gets a little disappointed because there's two other men um, at the uh, table with Philip Price and they introduce themselves. Um, their names is Saul, Saul and Jim and Philip Price introduces himself, introduces himself as the, you know, the masters, uh, master of the universe. and there we don't get a preview of what that possible um, dinner conversation was but we just come at towards the end of it and Philip Price is kind of dismissive of the guys saying you know Angela and I are going to have a drink which is our cue to leave and they say you know maybe Angela you we can have an, a, a, a lunch at some time as long as she pays and it was a bit of a joke and they leave and Price asked her, ask her what she thought about these two guys and she says you know Basically, in essence, they were okay. And he goes, what if I were to tell you that these two men were at the table with Kobe when the decision was made to cover up the um, waste, if you will, that poisoned her mother, the, the, the incident that caused her mother's death. And that these men are just, you know, in essence, ordinary men with wives and lives and things of that nature but also that they are thick as thieves, these two guys, and that they're that the decision to not clean up or reveal that the, the factory was being poisoned or poisoning the township, if you will, is not the only crime that they've done. They've done insider training, they've embezzled, 
They've done all sorts of other shady things. And that in this disc that he pulls out of his pocket and hands to Angela is all the evidence that's going to put them away. And basically leaves it up to her to decide what she wants to do with that information. And he walks away. And Angela goes, I don't trust your motivations. I don't trust this. And he whispers to her, you know, it's up to her to decide to do these things, basically. And, and kind of like in a most, what we typically consider a romantic fashion, he's whispering in her ears. And in a way, it, it was a kind of a sinister thing. In the, in the the closeness of what he's doing this, the kind of almost intimacy that he's doing this, it kind of hints at him calling the as she's calling the bullshit on him about giving her this disc, he's calling the bullshit on her, on her about putting this facade of being, you know, that this this dinner meeting that they were having was that of a romantic nature. And again, like I said, it, I'm not sure how to view Angela's storyline. I love it. I, I I like the direction. It's you know what is being presented to us. I don't know if this again is a slowly showing the corruption of a person within evil corp something that elliot had warned us about about you know money the invisible hand that makes the decisions for everything because after all angela was basically broke she had no job she was living with her father she was in tremendous amount of debt and here she is in a high-rise apartment uh, working for one of the biggest corporations still in the world even with the hack uh, getting paid extremely well um eating at a fine fine dine restaurant all these great and wonderful things are happening for her and it's all because of evil corp and are we going to see if you will a, a good person in essence a good person making immoral and bad decisions in order to maintain that wealth and prosperity which is not not that much different from the men that made the decision to cover up the uh, chemical spell that killed her mother. So, so it'll be interesting to see if that is the direction they're going or if she is, like I said, the ultimate double agent here and it's going to somehow help in taking down or just in her own pathway, if you will, take down Evil Corp. So that is the end of, you know, Angela's storyline and now we're going to go to Elliot. So we're now at the Elliot portion of the episode, which is probably the most dense part of the entire episode in itself, and it's very typical of of the show because Elliot, of course, is the, the main protagonist. But what we end up opening is with Elliot with the phone call with Tyler Wellick. And Tyler Wellick does not want to talk with Elliot over the phone. He doesn't think it's safe, and he doesn't think he... He's a little worried about Elliot, and Elliot wants to know... You know where he's at, and he wants to to continue to talk to Ella, to Tyler Wellick and find out what happened that day. But Mr. Robot interjects and and stops the conversation from continuing on. And as Elliot and and Mr. Robot are, are fighting, you know, he, Mr. Robot is like, "I delivered. You got to talk to Tyler Wellick." And Elliot's like, "No." Um, I talked to you. I have no idea if I really talked to that, you know, Tyler Willock. You know, he has no idea what is real and what is not. And as they're having this conversation over the television, um, Elliot finds out that Gideon has died, that he was murdered. And this puts Elliot in a tailspin. He he wants to get rid of Mr. Robot. He no longer he feels very guilty about what has happened happened to Gideon and he wants no no further part or interactions with Mr. Robot. So he asks Leon, his friend, for some pills. And Leon's like uh, he's not his keeper or his reaper and gives him these pills. Now Mr. Robot is disappointed. He thinks that Elliot is going to get back on the morphine again. But it's Adderall. And Elliot is gonna take um, the Adderall to keep himself up and keep himself focused to kind of remove Mr. Robot from his system to kind of push him out of his mind, if you will. And Mr. Robot's panicking. He's like panicked that this is what um, Elliot's going to do. And Elliot is just starts shoving these pills in his mouth and starts walking away from Mr. Robot and going back to his room. 
And that's when the man in black that kind of has like a, almost like a religious get up, if you will, uh, stops Elliot and he goes, hello, Mr. Anderson, we need to talk. Or not Anderson, but Alderson. And Elliot's like, is this, with his internal monologue, is this the FBI? Who is this guy? And then a car comes up and uh, takes Elliot, puts a bag over his head, and then takes Elliot to an undisclosed location, looks like an underground garage. Uh, he has these three men, There's it's only three men, uh, put him in a chair, tie him up, and then one of them comes up with a red uh, wheelbarrow, which is interesting because as the the name that is on his journal, uh, we have no idea at this point what the red wheelbarrow means. It might be a mnemonic, um, a password, a mnemonic means of him remembering something, but in it, the two guys pull, pour uh, cement powder and water and uh, get a funnel and start pouring this wet cement down Elliot's throat. And Elliot's panicking. He's looking at the man in black. He, you know, cement's coming down his throat. And what it turns out is that is not the case. It's Elliot is actually in his his room at this half the halfway house, and he's throwing up. He has three fingers down his throat, and he's throwing up. And Mr. Robot is there, and he has the the man in black's hat on and a shovel and he goes go ahead throw up those nasty pillows throw those other things up and Elliot's totally freaking out because at one point he was you know someplace else and now here he is you know th throwing up and he's looking at Mr. Robot and he's like you know I'm the screaming Mr. Robot I'm the screaming in your head you can't get rid of me I've burrowed so thoroughly into your head there's no way possible and Elliot, being defiant as ever, actually picks up the throw-up Adderall pills and puts them in his mouth. And he basically is telling Mr. Robot, who is telling him that, that you know, Mr. Robot owns Elliot, that nobody owns him. And that's the end of that scene. But as we go further on into Elliot's story, it turns out that Elliot has been up for three days... And then he's been taking these pills, uh, 200 milligrams, basically a day. And that it's keeping Mr. Robot gone. And he's he's having a great time. He feels more focused. He feels like he can focus on the world around him. That basically that he sees things clearly. That there's nobody encompassing him. He can't hear Mr. Robot. He can't hear the scream. And he's having if you will, a, a great time. He's like super high, super enthusiastic about all the things around him. And it's just a very bizarre, if you will, take about him trying to take take down um, Mr. Robot. You know, he starts, you know, he starts talking to us or his friend, I mean, you know, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to read to us, um, things of that nature. He's, He's enjoying the basketball game. He sees the world. He's having a great time. But then he talks to us again. And he goes, you're not buying this happy persona that he's putting up there. Um, by the fifth day, if you will, he's not sleeping. And he can feel that the scream is coming back. Um, that the Adderall is not quite working. It's just a really a temporary fix. Uh, he starts, uh, when he, next time he sees Leon, Leon's talking backwards. Things are um, glitching, if you will, like a like the Matrix, um, a glitch system, like everything's going digital. Uh, he starts seeing things. He sees three children um, in F Society mask. Um, he starts seeing computer breakdown flashes of code. He's going through what he disclosed to us earlier, which is a kernel panic, eternal fatal error, if you will. And a kernel panic is just the, it's from Linux, is the, the mechanism, the, the basic primary basis upon which an OS operating system is based off of. And if, if that gets damaged or faults, then the entire system crashes down. And that's what he's experiencing. He's experiencing a, a, a crash, if you will. And he can no longer keep Mr. Robot at bay. It's basically frying his system he, he wants he's just breaking down if you will he's 
slowly disintegrating. He he can't handle anything or everything. The the guilt of what happened to Gideon is consuming him. His inability to actually control Mr. Robot, if you will, is is weighing down on him. He he can't see anything. He's running out of pills. He knows that Mr. Robot's gonna come back. And as the sixth day approaches and he hasn't had any sleep, it's the numbness of everything. He's slowly, slowly just kind of going into a darker, darker place. He's slowly, you know, his fatigue, he looks worn out, he looks kind of sickly, if you will. And he has a bit of a break. He he has a breakdown. He goes into this very big, you know, he's in his church group, a religious rant about, you know, God and how this is all fictitious and there is no, not necessarily no God, but why would God care about us? Why would God care about all these different things about us? Why would, you know, God gives, gives anything about their life? And he just ranting and ranting and ranting about it. And he finally realizes towards the end of the, his rant that he's saying this out loud and that the, the church group heard him. These rants that he's always had internally have now been spoken out. And he takes his journal and he just throws it away. And he kind of just flees and goes back to his room. And then eventually what ends up happening is that he's sitting down in the diner and Ray comes up to him and Ray sits down excuse me, and starts talking to Elliot, and he kind of reveals, and I'm going to combine these two scenes here, he kind of reveals himself to Elliot that, you know, he, you know, he talks to himself too. Uh, He, you know, his wife died, you know, five years ago, and just one day, he just kind of sat down and started talking out loud to her, and then next thing you know, she's, she's talking back. And that he he understands Elliot. He understands what Elliot is going through. And he gives Elliot back his journal. He says, this is yours. You probably should have this back. And Elliot's like, no. I threw that out for a reason. And, you know, Ray pushes, pushes it back to him. and says, you know, you're probably going to need this. And it's very interesting because what was revealed through the episode is that while it seemed kind of like gibberish... There seems to be like some kind of code, if you will, or uh, computer code that he's been writing in his journal during this um, during his panic to kind of get rid of Mr. Robot. Uh, his he's basically there's a lot in his journal that he maybe he himself doesn't realize that he's writing down on a subconscious level that could potentially expose him as a person. And I think Ray is smart enough to understand that about Elliot that he that's why he gave him back the journal and we're going to go back a little bit back further because we learned something about Ray in this episode Um, we learned that he is basically I don't know what it is with Elliot and drug dealers but he uh he his business if he will that he's running um, is an online business. It deals with uh, Bitcoin, and he had someone beat up his network administrator, if you will, the guy who's running his site. Um, that has been down too long. That the, the site's been down too long, and the guy's saying that they need to migrate the network. He doesn't know how to do it. He just doesn't know how to do basic network. That the Bitcoin wallets keep getting. Um, drained, that they need to, to secure the hot and cold wallets, and they need somebody better than him to be able to do that for him. And I think Ray feels that Elliot is that person, that Elliot can somehow fix what is happening to Ray's business. And I think Ray is supposed to be some kind of analog to, or some inspiration of Silk Road, the dark web uh, site that was uh, shut down a couple of years ago. There's uh, several sites like that um, online where people purchase and buy drugs uh, through this the, the, through tour through that site and use Bitcoin to do so. So I think that's what may, maybe perhaps Mr. Robot and Mr. Ray had talked and Ray talked about was about this site about his business and Ray 
understands that Elliot is a sick individual, that he basically doesn't have control of himself as a person, but is a brilliant hacker or a brilliant computer person, and he wants Elliot to work for him. And so I think he, that's why he's been trying to get very friendly with Elliot. And as they're having this discussion about, you know, control and illusions and about the ability to, you know, the ability to talk to oneself, um, Elliot does meet with Ray again after their initial conversation about how does he control Mr. Robot? How does he get rid of him, if you will? And Ray is telling him that, that there is no control, that we're always falling, that we're always failing, if you will, and that the that the, the whole concept of him trying to control Mr. Robot is the wrong thing to do. And I think what Ray is going to probably end up leading Elliot to do is somehow kind of embracing Mr. Robot, if you will, embracing the persona, and this will be somehow a way for Elliot to somehow control Mr. Robot. Um, I don't know this deliberate and what the long game is with this, with the place that Elliot is right now. I don't know if Elliot has placed himself deliberately so he can get closer to Ray, or this is just incidental. I just it's just interesting that, you know, Elliot once again is entangled with potentially another drug dealer, if you will. But I think I'm not sure really where the direction of the series is going with this, with the whole um Elliot versus Mr. Robot, how Elliot will eventually get back into either F society or not. Um, I do like the way that they are kind of dealing with his mental illness and the fact that Elliot is trying to seek treatment, if you will, or is trying to seek a way to address his issues instead of just um, embracing the madness, if you will. I'm not sure if Ray is going to be the person that's going to help him, if it's going to lead him to embracing the madness, which is not a very good or healthy thing, or if Ray is going to help him through counseling or through some kind of measure be able to have some kind of peace within himself, to have some kind of sense of Elliot as a person. But I, I, in, overall, in general, because of, like, the little hints that are going on, I think I'm going to, after the fourth episode, kind of talk about some of the theories about the state of Elliot beyond just the, um, the prison theory out there about what's going on with his character, in particular, the direction of the show. I think there needs to be more shown before I express my own opinions, but go and kind of go in depth with some of the theories that are on the various boards but it's just interesting in the way the breakdown with his um, whole Adderall and his whole kind of happy attitude. It kind of reminded me of last season when he decided to uh, step away from F Society and st- decided to you know go to the dinner meeting or the dinner with Gideon. That he was like, I'm gonna go, you know, you know, ask Shayla out and you know, go to Marvel movies and be a normal person, to be normal. And I think this, that whole Adderall thing kind of not only reminded me of that, but the fact that Elliot can't be a normal person. He's not a normal person. And for him to kind of go in that direction, it's kind of against his overall system in general. But that's it for this chat. Um, I thank you all for listening. And until next time. Thank you for joining us on this chat. You can find us on all podcast outlets such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, MixCloud, and any podcast catcher. You can reach us on Twitter at FSocietyIRC, our website at FSocietyIRC.xyz. You can email us at FSocietyIRC at ProtonMail.com. Our music attributes are under the Creative Commons license number three. The intro music is by Monk. The song is called The Planet Shakers, the Paragraph Remix. Our outro music is by Trevet Halbeka, and the song is Zelfikapa, as well as Kwana, and the song is Demons. You can support the show either via the QR code in the show notes by contributing with a Bitcoin, or through PayPal 
and there's a link in the show notes where you can pay file me under Herosia Shide. If you're very into uh, cryptocurrency, you can also tip me through uh, Chainship at Herosia, or at one name at Herosia. Thank you very much for listening, and look forward to hearing from you. Logging off. This has been a Herosia Shide Space Odyssey Network production.